Okay. I think we're just about ready to begin at 8, 8, 8 p.m. Lance, are you all set? Absolutely. Wonderful. Good evening, everyone, and welcome back to our fourth round table on anti-Black racism in the Canadian context. I am pleased to, to see so many of you back again. Um, these sessions are hosted by Black Anglicans of Canada, and we're just delighted that you are back with us again after our fourth week. This evening, we have a very, 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 very special guest. All the way from rainy Barbados, Reverend Dr. Sonia Hines, who once upon a time was a, um, a priest in serving in the Diocese of Toronto. And I have to say that Reverend Sonia was one of the first black female priests I've ever spoken to. And I would say who have been a mentor and a friend to me. So we, I, I'm really grateful. To, um, to have her back with us um, from Barbados. So Sonia, um, welcome. And we are so delighted that you are able to share your, your gifts of words with us. So um, our program again will continue in the same format as, as in the past three weeks. We are here for one very tight hour and we're, we've been relatively faithful um, to that time, um, except for a few people who decide to hang around and chat until I think last week it was 10.30, poor Lance forgot to turn off the recording. <laughs> so, but we will officially end our time together at 9 p.m. sharp. Our moderator is uh, Miss Yvonne Murray, and um, you will hear more from Yvonne later on in our, in our program. So we begin our time together with the land acknowledgement. And let us pray that uh, that Zoom will cooperate and, um, and that all will go well. Please pray for us. Today we honor and acknowledge that this land and locality in which we live, move and breathe is the historical traditional lands of the indigenous peoples of what we call Turtle Island and what is commonly called North America. As we journey together, may we seek the path of justice, reconciliation and renewal. And may we, may we commit ourselves to be partners in healing and peace to the glory and thanksgiving of God, our creator. We have a sluggish PowerPoint. So let us continue. We, um, in addition to that, I will now read um, Black Anglicans of Canada, our declaration. This is kind of just a statement that we use um, at the beginning of our gatherings just to affirm our own purpose and our mission and our mandate. So this is Black Anglicans of Canada declaration. We as people of African descent are commissioned and called to be ambassadors of reconciliation. We're called to create opportunities and space for courage building, healing, fellowship, and empowerment. This special calling is both a reminder and a challenge to ourselves and to the whole church that we are no longer destined to just obey, suffer, and witness, but to disrupt, heal, and lead. And so with that, we have our vision and uh, our mission and we have goals and these documents will be available. If anybody would like a copy, just let us know. Please, please, please um, cooperate with us. PowerPoint. PowerPoint has fallen asleep. <laughs> but we will continue because we are ready for, for these type of... Jacqueline, if you could uh, maybe log out of uh, PowerPoint and come back in again. Maybe, maybe it might be... Uh kind and generous to us. Yeah, we are fine because we did plan for this. Okay. So at this point, I am going to hand it over to um, um, Yvonne Murray, who is a member of our leadership team for Black Anglicans of Canada. I also want to just point out that we are, um, this, these sessions are, have been planned and supported by our leadership team of seven. 
Um, myself um, and, Lance, and Lance Wilson are the co-chairs of Black Anglicans. We have communication and membership um, lead, who is Ms. Anita Gittens. We have um, Brother Reginald Crenshaw, who is responsible for spiritual care. And then we have a finance and governance team that includes um, Reverend Vernal Savage, Ms. Yvonne Murray, Ms. Dolores Lawrence, and our patron is um, Bishop Peter Fenty. So these are all the stuff that you would have seen on PowerPoint, but we're sharing it with you. So at this point, I'm going to hand it over to Yvonne, and, um, and then we will cancel this um, screen sharing so that um, we can um, see everybody's face. Over to you, Yvonne, for the introduction and um, for Sonia's bio. Thank you, Reverend Jacqueline. It's a pleasure for me to introduce to you a friend, Reverend Sonia Hines, to share her experiences and expertise with us on bending the knee and changing the hearts, a Toronto model for a just multicultural church. Reverend Dr. Sonia Hines is currently director of St. Leonard's Anglican Church. She felt a call to be a priest in the Anglican Church at a time when the Caribbean province of the West Indies had not yet decided that women were also called to the ordained ministry. This allowed a waiting period of 12 years, which strengthened her resolve to listen more earnestly to the Holy Spirit. During the discernment period, she worked full time at the government industrial school while studying for a BA in theology as a full time student at Codrington College. In her working career, Reverend Sonia was a secondary school teacher, probation officer, guide and counselor, and a supervisor at the government industrial school, a correctional institution for girls where she was employed over nine years. For her postgraduate studies, a master's in sacred theology and Christian spirituality, her thesis was informed by her experiences as supervisor at the government's Correctional Institution for Girls. While a student at Codrington College, Reverend Sonia published the chapter, Christian Mission in the Caribbean in the International Review of Mission. While serving in Toronto, she also published the book, Beyond the Journey, Women's Stories of Settlement and Community. And she also presented a paper in Suriname on the fifth mark of mission towards an ecologic, ecological womanish theology of nature. And Reverend Sonia has recently published an article, Spiritual Justice Towards the Womanish Spirituality of Spiritual Care. Reverend Sonia is currently a part-time lecturer in ascetical theology at the Codrington College and enjoys the experience of being a facilitator and a mentor by creating a student-focused environment. I will now hand you over to Reverend Dr. Sonia Hines, who will share her experiences and expertise with us. Reverend Sonia. Thank you, Yvonne. Thank you very much. I'm happy to be here tonight and to see some familiar faces. So good night to all of you from all the way in Barbados. I want to thank Jacqueline in particular, but certainly the Black Anglicans of Canada for this invitation. I had the opportunity to listen to the other presentations and I am humbled that I am part of such an illustrious team. However, I'm still not sure speaking after Dr. Carl James, even after, even a week later was such a good idea. I dedicated my doctoral thesis to two persons, both of whom had died. My mother and someone who had never had the opportunity, the, the honor or privilege of meeting, Professor Romney Mosley. Although a Bayesian and an Anglican like myself, my sense of his mission on his earthly journey caused me to join no longer strangers, read the report to the General Synod of the same name, and continue this work in the doctoral program that I concluded in 2014. I call it the work of inclusion, 
In fact, in acknowledging him in the thesis, I wrote, his spirit lives on in the work that he began. And that is perhaps one of the reasons that we are here tonight and have gathered over the last three weeks. We are part of this mission to move the church from having its knees in the back of some of its members' necks to opening hearts, so to embracing its rich ethnic and racial diversity. I want to begin with a story. When I arrived in the Diocese of Toronto in 2001, the Anglican, the newspaper of the Diocese of Toronto, carried information on what I call its editorial page. Part of it states a community of 285 congregations in 217 parishes covering 26,000 square kilometers. Of the nearly 5 million people who live within the diocesan boundaries, just under 1 million claim to be affiliated with the Anglican Church, with about 100,000 people identified on the parish road. The diocese is home to many, and this is the important part, the diocese is home to many ethnic and language-based congregations including Chinese, Filipino, French, Hispanic, Japanese, Korean, and Tamil. Tamil. The city of Toronto has the largest population of Aboriginal peoples in the country. That's the end of it. One day when I could no longer be comfortable reading this in the paper as a Black Caribbean woman of African descent, I decided to call the editor, Stuart Mann, and told him the challenge I was to the exclusion of Caribbean peoples, of Blacks. By the next edition, Mr. Mann made the correction and gained my respect. Later, when I sat as the Anglican representative on the Canadian Churches Forum for Global Ministry and had the honor of working with Alice Tudor and Jonathan in the Canadian Churches Forum for Global Ministry, I met his sister, Andrea, and I recognized that it might have been a family retreat, this openness to having ch the church to work at being, becoming more inclusive and welcoming. Yet after joining with others on six occasions to nominate and vote for the then Archdeacon Peter Penge to be bishop in this diocese, I soon recognized that this fast pace was not the usual practice. And I continue to be challenged at how the church, meaning here now the Diocese of Toronto, was making some strong statements about leadership and therefore its vision and mission in reimagining church. Having grown up in the same parish family as Bishop Peter Fenty, I have always been aware, like many Anglicans and non Anglicans in the Caribbean, prior to his leaving his home diocese, that he was called to be a bishop that this was not borne out on six occasions in the Diocese of Toronto caused us to pause and reflect more seriously on racism in the Anglican Church. In addition, the removal of the part-time position of diocesan multicultural officer, the practice of paying for the use of the parish of St. Paul's Grocery for diocesan service to celebrate Black History Month, are just two telling stories that suggest the topic bending the knee and changing the heart and is therefore up for a conversation on anti-Black racism. However, my research tonight is based on ethnic, ethnically and racially diverse congregation where I was in incumbent from 2001 to 2009, the parish of Christchurch, Scarborough Village. Yet I believe that it allows the conversation on anti-Black racism to be deepened in the context of multicultural Toronto. Thus, this session will discuss some findings of the doctoral thesis and how an ethnically and racially diverse Anglican congregation practices worship in a multicultural setting. It uses three worshiping practices, sharing meals, singing on joint Sunday worship, and exercising leadership to discuss this phenomenon and challenges the notion of a multicultural church to recommend the move to a just multicultural church where welcoming differences is critical to being the church. Surprisingly, little has been written on the multicultural church and the Anglican Church of Canada after the Mosley report, although that research tells us that it is a significant area for the Anglican Church of Canada, Canada to pursue. 
So it goes without saying that it was not going to be an easy undertaking. The research has attempted to continue the conversation began almost two decades ago. The starting point for developing a perspective of cultural diversity in an Anglican setting, therefore, might be the Pentecost experience as recorded in the Acts of the Apostle. Here, the Spirit enabled the speaking of different languages. What an affirmation of cultural diversity. For the Christian church, however, it can go further back. The story of the call of Abraham and Sarah to migrate. Biblical narrative could be used by the Christian religion as a basis of the belief that God calls people to move from their countries of birth to other countries. Consequently, migration is essential to cultural diversity since Christians believe by faith that God still extends that invitation in today's world. So strong is this perspective of God calling people to migrate that the three Abrahamic religions, Judaism, Christianity, Islam, have embraced this notion. In Abraham's call to migrate, these religions seem to recognize a signal from God that migration was part of a divine will. And although migration can be affected by social and political influences, this religious overtone provided a context for the three religions. But for them, God affirms migration and thus cultural diversity. In the situation of the Anglican Church of Canada in the multicultural setting of Toronto, however, migration for diverse Anglicans could be a challenge given the name Anglicanism. Kevin Ward in the history of global Anglicanism warns that although the Anglican communion describes itself as a fellowship or communion of autonomous Christian churches, united by a common history, confessing a common faith, and traditionally a common liturgy. Anglicanism is commonly seen as very English, a hangover of the British Empire and anachronism. Its very name seems to proclaim its limitations. The Anglican communion seems peculiarly unfortunate in being saddled with what appears to be either a specific space, place, or a particular ethnic group. Anglican is, after all, simply another word for English. How can a communion be truly worldwide with such a parochial name? How can it be truly local in Ghana or Uganda, Barbados or Brazil, and of course? Similar questions can be asked in the context of Canada and of other Christian denominations. As a former British colony, Canada's ties to the British Empire places it in a peculiar position when Anglicanism is expressed among diverse members in one congregation, many of whom, like Anglicans in Canada, lived in former British colonies. One Caribbean Anglican cleric and theologian captures this context when he points out that the gospel came to us, meaning Caribbean peoples, this is Leslie Lett, on the back of colonialism, whose assumptions concerning the colonized, their potential and their destiny and value system have penetrated and often perverted the gospel. What was produced in the process was a colonized church. A similar point is made by Wendy Flusher when she reflects on Canadian Anglicanism. She knows that the Canadian church developed from the colonial activity of the British crown. They sought to disseminate this uniquely English religion along with English economic political and cultural power around the world, end of quote. This also meant that the Anglican Church and the state were allies that had similar ideology. So let us look now at some of the responses with analysis from participants who were members of the Christchurch Scarborough Village, who can be described as persons who came from one colonized church to an, into another. Sharing meals. One South Asian remarked, I saw segregation during coffee hour, when each group was together. Not mingling among the other groups, everyone stuck in his or her own group. Another person from the Caribbean, a black person, said, when asked why she did not attend, when she did not attend the coffee, coffee hour, her quick response was, I do not drink coffee. It seems that the thought that it was also a time of fellowship might have eluded her. 
another South Asian participant recalled, I remember the time when samosas were introduced and there was some resistance initially, but now everyone eats samosas. Because it was considered a novelty to the parish in Toronto when the annual trope Tuesday Pancake Supper was renamed Pancake and Samosa Supper at Christchurch Cabot Village. A local television and radio station crew, after seeing the church's advertisement, arrived on the evening of the event for interviews and photographs. The event was later televised on a local station. A South Asian said, when I arrived for over 30 years ago, there were a lot of whites attending the fellowship activities, and then they stopped. In recent months, there were uh, more fellowship activities, but some of the whites do not attend. The self-exclusion of some whites from, there, from when there is the sharing of meals might be linked to the issue of white privilege, a concept that we can return to later. The other practice saying during worship and the worship. One black Calvin person say, more singing is needed. There's a need to have the African drum join other services and not only for Black History Month. A South Asian or Indian say, I would like to have the Indian banjo used in worship, not only the organ. The Indian priest who was then the honorary assistant encouraged hard clapping, but not appreciated by some of the long-term white members. And one white parishioner said, there's a sense of unity during the celebrations of different cultures on the day of Pentecost. And the third practice that I think study was leadership. One white parishioner said, I was asked to teach Sunday school over 50 years ago, soon after I joined the parish. And within a short period of time, I was asked to be the Sunday school superintendent. One black parishioner said, I came to this country as a cradle Anglican. I was asked by the white priest when I came in the 70s to be the treasurer. Although I was attending this church for a long time, I was never asked, but this was only after he learned that I was qualified in that field. On South Asian side about leadership, the black female priest asked my husband in 2003 to participate in leadership roles. He was already very active in the Anglican church in Delhi. The research and some of the above references leave no doubt on them in my mind that the Anglican Church of Canada plays a very important role in the construction of racialized identity. This is the reason that it is my conviction that the Anglican Church of Canada is called to dismantle, dismantle permanently the image of a church that is perceived of having what Canadian pleasure calls historic privilege and pay attention then to the needs of all his congregants as it continues to represent Jesus Christ in contemporary multicultural Toronto. Anglican right, uh, priest and writer, the Reverend, right, the Reverend Dr. Roland Cormano is more direct. He, report, he says, we are, to put it bluntly, an old church dominated by English speakers and English culture at the same time. We are part of a new land, still struggling to find national, political, and religious expression. The struggle is complicated by the arrival of other ethnic groups, which have to some extent displaced the older anglo or Anglo-Saxon populations in numbers, but not necessarily in, in, influence, in influence. It is complicated also by the influx of the native Canadians into the larger city, and of course. But there have been efforts. It is in the Anglican Church of Canada's Charter for Racial Justice that uh, Bishop Fendi had um, mentioned a couple of weeks ago. After some revision, the Charter was approved as the official anti-racism statement of the General Synod of the Anglican Church of Canada in 2007. And could be an indication that the Anglican Church of Canada and therefore the Diocese of Toronto is recognizing racism as a prominent issue as it explores how Anglicans experience worshiping practices that speak to their lived experience. For example, the Charter defines racism as the belief reinforced by power and privilege that one race is innately superior to other races. 
The document was detailed in its was detailed in its recommendation to the 2007 General Synod, following the thinking of the Church of England in a similar report. That report called An Amazing Journey, the Church of England's Response to Institutional Racism, a Personal Perspective. Actively a woman in the Church of England who migrated to England from Trinidad and Tobago, Glenn Gordon Carter report. It, meaning institutional racism, persists because of the failure of the organization openly and adequately to recognize and address its existence and cause its existence and causes by policy, example, and leadership. Before recognition and action to eliminate such racism, it can prevail as part of the ethos or culture of the organization. It is a corrosive disease. End of quote. In light of all of these and other findings, I propose the concept of a just multicultural church at this juncture. And we claim the concept multicultural. However, I have qualified multicultural with a term that carries biblical weight, just. In allowing the concept multicultural to be used in a positive way, the Anglican Church of Canada, the Diocese of Toronto included, of course, we in a the cultural diversity that started in the prophetic material and at the day of Pentecost. Robert McPhee Brown highlights that if you read your Bible, you will discover that justice appears to be God's middle name. End of quote. And Iris Marion Young maintains that God's justice, or when it is right, includes the absence of oppression, not just the presence of distributive right. End of quote. The shift in our thinking from multicultural to just multicultural will help, I believe, the Anglican Church to also remain aware of its prophetic voice as a church. This awareness helps us to remain on the path that moves towards creating a more welcoming church, where the ethnic, racial, and cultural diversity of members are integrated in the worshiping practices and by extension in the society. There are two components of the just multicultural church, gender justice and racial justice. However, they are not separate but interlock and stand at the intersection of classism, heterosexism, and other injustices. What then does the just multicultural church look like? For me, the just multicultural church is a dynamic process, not a goal in itself. A just multicultural church invites Anglicans to engage with each other as they worship together and live with others in the multicultural milieu of Toronto. My choice of terminology of using just is not innocent. It might even be considered a major shift. For by using the concept of a just multicultural church, I am seeking to problematize the assertion that the Anglican church and the Canadian government seem to be seeing that race, ethnicity, and culture all in the same negative light. This just multicultural vision, however, caused Anglicans in Canada to reflect on the history of the Anglican Church of Canada, Anglicanism in Canada, and the contemporary cultural diversity seen in Canadian society. As can be seen by the examination of the Christchurch Cabal Village study, congregations that have more than one culture represented are being challenged to understand church in a different manner than was traditionally done to the rise to in migrants from the global south. Cal James helps us with a definition of culture. According to James, culture exists of a dynamic and complex set of values, beliefs, norms, patterns of thinking, styles of communication, linguistic expressions, and ways of interpreting and interacting with the world that help people understand and thus survive their circumstances. End of quote. James' definition then might provide the reason that Christchurch, scattered villages, plant kids suffer, might be a time when all the congregants gather for more than sharing meals what has been observed is that they gather for laughter, discussion, sharing both joy and sadness, acknowledging that at the center of that human fellowship 
is the unfolding of the story of the all-embracing love of Jesus Christ. The Anglican Church of Canada, therefore, is called to honor cultural differences and move beyond tolerance to engage in worshipers in meaningful worshiping practice. What is not needed is a situation where congregants are appreciated as long as they conform to established customs and practices. When he make, uh, highlights that the temptation to, inclu to include in this manner is especially seductive to a nation which has multiculturalism as a, an avowed ideal, but which often stops at the song and dance or ethnic food threshold before entering the household of the other. I believe that the just multicultural church will allow the Diocese of Toronto to continue its re examination of the challenges that the concept ways and multiculturalism form. Thus, my recommendation of this new term. I see that its worshiping practices might have led to prejudice and resistance on the basis of ethnicity, race, and culture, in spite of the intentions of well-meaning programs and policies. In the just multicultural church, the ethnic, racial, and cultural diversity are uh, taken into consideration in the liturgical planning and governance of the parish. The parish priests and their leadership are trained in intercultural skills and have a clear sense of mission being God's mission and themselves being part of that mission. In addition, the liturgical team makes sure that international hymns, that is, hymns that are from countries represented in the congregation and elsewhere, are included regularly. Scripture is read in languages other than English and French. Drums and banjos are played during Sandu liturgy. And those who were born outside of Canada will be encouraged to wear their national attire, to name a few examples, and not just wear them on Pentecost Sunday. Finally, the just multicultural church plays a prophetic role. It is no coincidence that the Truth and Reconciliation Commission in South Africa was initiated by a Black Anglican, Archbishop Desmond Tutu, who understood that God's justice is exemplified in the prophetic material in the Hebrew scriptures and moves us beyond revenge to empowering. In the book of Amos, for example, a major theme is that religion before justice is no religion at all. Amos describes the Israelites as enthusiastically participating in religious pilgrimage, pilgrim pilgrimages and festivals, and even tithing, tithing, but their treatment of the righteous and needy violates their condition with God, their covenant with God. According to Letty Russell, justice requires a practice of solidarity to end oppression beyond working of individual access and insurance of rights. There is important work to be done, as the Diocese of Toronto is well aware, that moves from becoming, that, that allows it to move to become a just multicultural church. The increasing democratic, demographic shift in Toronto and the recognition of the integration of Aboriginals, South Asians, Africans, Caribbeans, English, and European people in the congregation suggests that the just multicultural church is urgently needed. It allows for further exploration of concepts of inclusion, difference, and solidarity to be examined. It is my hope that the Anglican Diocese of Toronto will continue to move in the direction of building just multicultural congregations so as to enable worshiping practices, including singing during worship, Sunday worship, exercising leadership, and sharing of needs to be reflective of a church that, conti that continues the cultural diversity as recorded in the Acts of the Apostles. So if the, the proposal of a just multicultural church and the significance of the study helped the Anglican Church of Canada to recognize its special role in society as it reflects cultural diversity and to dialogue and collaborate with partners, then there are areas of further research that are being prompted. The questions that may be asked is how can the Anglican Church as a global institution with membership in many countries respond, even at the parish level, more adequately to Jesus' challenge to love one another as I love you. 
in achieving them the recognition of cultural diversity in the worshiping practices in a, uh, addressing this in a multicultural setting. What can the Anglican Church of Canada do to stimulate rethinking of this goal in the contemporary context of multicultural Toronto? Like Robin Mosley, I have not and surely cannot devise a final answer. For all congregations in the Anglican Church in the Canada it has to work use, has to work towards the, the goal in different ways. Still, I see at least four potentially viable areas to which the contemporary Anglican Church of Canada can be engaged and at the same time engage Canadian society as they move towards a just multicultural church. They are placed under four headings. One, theological education and training. Two, qualitative research and worshiping practices. Three, ecumenism and interreligious inter dialogue and action, or living with people of other denominations and other faiths. And four, is a just multicultural spirituality. I, in looking at theological education and training, it is with the assumption that God is already working in the lives within and outside the church, and that God uses all sorts and conditions of human beings to bring about God's reign on earth. Theological education and training is a critical component for those who are involved in creating just multicultural congregations. In terms of qualitative research into worshiping practices in the Anglican Church, qualitative research into how parishes and their worshiping practices are responding to the growing multicultural communities in Toronto is important for the growth of culturally diverse parishes. The study reinforces the need and usefulness of qualitative studies in worshiping practices in multicultural ministry. It also reinforces the value of approaching certain questions from the pastoral theologian's perspective. This allowed the parish priest's perspective to be filtered through a theological lens. This viewpoint would be different from that of the social scientist, for example, by the questions that the pastor poses. And three, in terms of the ecumenism, interreligious dialogue and action, the Canadian Ecumenical Anti-Racism Network could be a starting point. And four, developing a just multicultural spirituality. This speaks to the outlook and attitudes we have of God and living with each other. This is a way of worshiping God and living with others while conscious that all are created by a loving God. It is this loving God that then leads all to be to the stepping stones for congregants to become hospitality ministers. Anglicans as partners in God's mission become must become aware that we step up in faith between and among religious cultural groups, both inside and outside the Anglican Church. The title of Carl James' book, Seeing Ourselves, Exploring Race, Ethnicity and Culture, a book that needs to be studied and inwardly digested by Anglicans, particularly those living and worshiping in the province of Canada, and should be on the book list of the Toronto School of Theology. Things are an important area. We Anglicans must see ourselves and others as created in the image of God. By that I mean that we, the church, must see racism as it is, as sin, and continue then the work begun by one mean most. Thank you. Thank you, Reverend Stephen, for sharing your experiences and expertise and your research with us. And also, it's um, a good reminder for us, who many of us are immigrants, to remind us that Abraham was called to leave his homeland and to go somewhere else. It's, um, it's to tell us that it's started way back, in the, way back in the book of Genesis. So thank you for that reminder. Um, I see we have some questions coming in. And please put your questions on, on chat. We have a question here for you. Um, Reverend Sonia, it's uh, an observation, really, and I just, it says, it's my observation that Black people were well inducted into the church, but blinded in the ability to refute pastors and priests of the biblical contradictions. Any like to comment on this? I can repeat it. You know. Yeah, please. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> it says that black people was well inducted into the church, but blinded in the ability to refute pastors or priests of the biblical contradictions. So what's the question the person is asking? It sounds like they're just- uh, I guess um, they're saying that many of, especially maybe from the black countries, you do not question the religion, you accept. I, I, I don't support that. Um, I, I think that um, there was a time when that might have been so, um, but given the way how the church is operating now, uh, certainly in the Caribbean, um, we, we have gone past that in many ways. Um, yes, there, there was a history where I think when persons saw the, the person that was in charge of the church, um, whether, whether the person was a, a white priest or even a, a black priest, that there was there some hesitation around um, whether you should question um, anything that you had in mind. I don't think that is as, as, as prevalent now as it used to be. Okay. So another question here. I feel it's time to re-examine almost everything. <laughs> the nature of our buildings, our liturgy, our music, down to our vestments. Where can we begin to alter the very nature of our churches to be more inclusive and aware in the 21st century? I think that there is, is a need for us to um, look again at how we Anglicans um, are, are Anglicans and, and to be able to embrace the differences. Um, but in terms of what, I, what does person seem to be saying, if I'm understanding it correctly, um, is that we might need to start thinking of changing uh, how we do things as Anglicans, and I will support that. Yeah, okay. Mm -hmm. We have another question here. We, um, this person is wondering how in our quest will permanently dismantle systemic racism that has already been ingrained so much in the status quo. Say that first part again. How in our quest Will we permanently dismantle systemic racism that has already been ingrained at a school? It's so, it's almost a way we of life. We keep going. Yeah, I, I think that it won't happen overnight, um, but we, it is something that we got to keep working at. And certainly, these kind of conversations helps us to, to see that re education is important and therefore rethinking about um, certain things. It's not going to be something that. Um, will happen overnight. Certainly the incident with um, George Floyd um, it, mm -hmm. it was probably happened long after the civil rights movement in America, but the, the struggle continues. Um, and so too in, in the church, if we had to make any changes that we will have to see how we can keep going forward um, in making some changes as we go along. And certainly not to give up or to become skeptical. Okay. There's another of the comments. As long as I have been involved in ministry in Toronto, apart from some white siblings and allies, most of the work of multiculturalism was seen as that of ethnic groups. White congregations may not necessarily feel the problem is theirs. How can we be helped to better appreciate how the ministry, appreciate the ministry in this context? What's the question? How do we, I heard it first. Yeah, because the white congregation, they look mm -hmm. as multiculturalism, culturalism or ethnic group as um, the ethnic people's problem. It's their concern yeah. of theirs. So how can they be helped to better appreciate the ministry in this context? in terms of being a part of this and, and being part of the solution then, instead of it's your business over here, you ethnic people. <laughs> oh, I, I, that, that might be something that somebody else might be able to answer better than me, so I, I can leave that out. One of the things that I find really interesting while I was living in Toronto, 
um, is that I think it was no frills. I can't remember if it was all another supermarket, but they will have this section in the supermarket that has ethnic foods. And this section we're having all these other these foods that are supposedly eaten by these ethnic groups mm -hmm. um, that are customers. And before us, before I um, and I wonder sometimes if we 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 work it like that in the church, that we think that there's these ethnic groups that we need to deal with, or that the the white people need to understand. Mm -hmm. um, rather than see that we are all of different ethnic groups. Um, one of the things that Charles and uh, Carl James has helped me to understand in that book and, and in, in other literature is that we need to understand the difference between ethnicity and race or ethnic group and, and the whole question of race. Mm -hmm. So that then the, the whites will understand that they are part of an ethnic group too. So the person that, that put the sign up in your first um, clearly didn't, didn't read Carl James or didn't, didn't get, get the yeah. memo that we all are part of, a, a, of an, ethnic, an ethnic group. So we all have to work together to, to understand that. Okay. But seeing that the church is suffering from the colonial effects, the current entire church, the current Anglican church is suffering from the colonial effects. Should we not be focusing on decolonizing the Anglican church? How do we do that? <laughs> I guess that's the, that is the <laughs> question. <laughs> that's the question I have to <laughs> uh, Decolonizing. Well, there's, there's a whole lot around decolonization in terms of theology and so on. Um, but but it, it is not a sit back and do um, and read. It is it's really getting your feet dirty. And I think if the, the Diocese of Toronto is really serious, um, it needs to get its feet dirty in terms of putting a position, not just anybody in a position, but putting somebody in a position that understands, that, that has some knowledge about cultural diversity, some, some, some training in racism, anti-racism, anti-black racism work, so that when they, we, they, we go forward, we go forward knowledgeable, uh, and, and, and focused in a way, instead of just putting things in place, but with no serious um, reflection. But the, the, the work continues that I believe started with the report by Wabney Mosley, um, No Longer Strangers, um, um, Ministry in a Multicultural Society. Um, I think mm -hmm. although we focus on, on Blacks, the question that arises out of multiculturalism is that there's a concept used in the law engine in Canada called visible minorities. That is part of the problem, that kind of language. Oh, so you, right. have, you have people classified that are considered visible minority. So they're visible, but they're in minority. And, and they are not people that are white. So if, if we have to deal with that in, in terms of translating it to how we understand ministry in the Anglican church, mm -hmm. we have mm -hmm. to start um, questioning that kind of language and using language that is more inclusive. And, and uh, some work has to be done in terms of training of clergy. Oh, okay. Yes, we have another comment here. The church can have the best resolutions and policies in the world. But if we do not get a change in the attitudes of the people, especially in the way they view one another, change is very hard to achieve. That's true. You have uh, what you know. Yeah. Any questions? Yeah. Okay. Now we have um, someone here. Let me just get this question. Sorry if I take a little thing. I'm just bringing up my curse here. <laughs> Sorry. Um, yes. You said, uh, Reverend Sonia, that you were called to the priesthood when the women were excluded as a priest of the Caribbean. And when you immigrated to Canada and faced anti-Black racism. Now you're back in the Caribbean. 
Can you talk about the intersection of race and gender in the hope of, for a just church? <laughs> yeah, race and gender, those two of those go together. We had a general secretary of the World Council of Churches many years ago say, that said, racism, like sexism, is sin. Oh. Put two of those together in one sentence. And uh, what I had to do with the whole question of sexism prior to coming to Canada, I had to deal with racism in Canada. And it was, it's probably no coincidence that when we do not, when we treat other youth people that are different from us, um, it, it allows that, those kind of things to be, to be, to be real. So in, in returning now as a person who was inside but outside the church, yeah. before I, let, I went to Canada, um, coming back in, the reality is very similar. Because I think the church, whether it's the Diocese of Toronto or the Church of Canada or the Church of the Caribbean, continues to struggle with accepting differences. And, and differences um, that allows you to, to see that the Holy Spirit is working in ways that we don't always understand, but because it's different, um, people reject it. So, so we, the struggle continues in the sense that we still, I still find that the church is dealing with racism in the Caribbean context. I presented a paper um, only about two weeks ago on the Anglican Church and institutionalized racism and pointed out how the, that, was, that, that was part of our reality as Anglicans here in, in Barbados in particular. So it, it, that racism thing is not something that happens outside of the Caribbean, but it, it is also there. And, and the, of course, the whole question of gender and injustices continue as well. Okay. There's another comment here. Some Anglicans are angry that the indigenous territorial acknowledgement is read every Sunday. They are still saying this, although the residential school issue was concluded by the church 20 years ago. I know some parishioners are still conflicted by this basic issue. How can we move forward? Any by, 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 by constantly looking back. So I think that sometimes we want to move forward and forget what happened in the past. I think we have to, in order to really go forward, we have to keep learning from the lessons in the past. So just because somebody apologized, for example, or just because you put somebody to be in charge of the cultural diversity um, uh, or the multicultural thing, mm -hmm. it doesn't solve the problem. It means that, some, that the work continues, that the work to, to be more inclusive and to, to, and to continue to move from tolerance to uh, embracing um, the, the different diverse um, congregations. So I, I, I'm, I, all of that to say that I think that's something we have to go back to go forward, to go back to go forward. We can't just keep going forward. We have oh, to learn yeah. the and fast. Right, right. Beyond the current expressions through vestments and music, do you have any thoughts about Black liturgy in Anglicanism and what might that be? Yes, definitely we got to start with the, the food and the dancing and the clothing. I moved to some serious conversations around the whole question of racism. Um, I, I don't have a problem putting on African attire. Last Sunday in Barbados, we had National Day of Significance, remembering the 1937 riots, and this is a season of emancipation in Barbados at the moment. So we are able to recall the African history that we have here. And people put on their um, African attire. But having um, persons come in to talk about the history, how we got there and what happened after we got there, and what we are doing now, we will certainly be able to guide us even further into us um, moving forward together. But the food and dance and the clothing thing, um, uh, uh, not enough. Okay. Well, time is run out of us, Reverend Sonia, so <laughs> we have to um, wrap up at this time. For those uh, who have questions and we couldn't get to it, I guess we can um, get it through later and you'll get it on um, 
veil or something. So Reverend Sonia, I wish to okay. thank you so very much for sharing with us and taking the You're time welcome. to contribute to our conversation right. on anti-Black racism in the Canadian context. And I thank you. I have put my email address in the chat, um, just in case some of my friends uh, who are in the chat this night have a uh, contact to me recently would like to do so. So just in case, Sonia Hayes for okay. gmail.com is there. Thank you, Yvonne. Thank you, Reverend Sonia. Thank you, Sonia. Uh, and thank you Jackie, uh, Jacqueline, for um, inviting me. No problem. Um, I'll pass it on to Reverend Jacqueline. Thanks again, folks, for being here with us, our fourth um, evening of amplifying anti-Black racism within the Canadian context. We are so delighted that you've joined us. We have more to come in August. We have a fresh slate of, um, of different voices from our community. Next week, we have a historian, the Reverend um, Denise Gallard will be with us, um, Canadian Black Church History. And Reverend Denise is a Nova Scotian uh, Indigenous, I think a 10th generation or 9th generation um, Indigenous um, Black Canadian, and she um, will be a, an incredible storyteller. So please join us next week. And then we have more to come. So please um, come on back. August is full and September, um, you, won't, you don't want to miss it. So please continue to join us and to join the conversation as we, as we try to amplify um, anti-Black racism within the Canadian context. And we just appreciate your time and your support. Black Anglicans of Canada, we are just a new group trying to just find our, our, our footing. So we appreciate your support. So if you want to support us, please do so via um, our Black Anglicans at gmail.com. And um, we do not um, say no to any amount of donation, great or small, we'll take it. Um, just send us an e-transfer with the password dismantle. And once again, thank you very much to our person on the control, Lance Wilson, my co-chair. Co co um, thanks for your um, hosting. And um, um, thanks to Zoom for, for, for staying steady throughout our, um, to, um, for our time together. And thanks again, everyone, for, for joining us this evening. Yeah. Thank you.